marriage, people say, oh, you marry your best friend, but in some ways you're marrying, you know, over time you're marrying yourself. You're marrying this person who's always there with you and who knows you and you know, and who knows what's good about you and what's, and what's not. I mean, that's what a, you know, a real relationship. And that's why marriage, you know, when it goes bad, it can go so bad and be so scary is because, you know, you have this person who knows every weakness as uh, your own weaknesses, as well as you do. And you know, her, you know, or his weaknesses as well as he does. And so you can really tear at the other person. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Alex Berenson. I remember reading his first book, The Faithful Spy, his first John Wells novel back in 2006, and loving it. And now I think there are 12 books in that series. 12 John Wells novels, yeah. 12. And today we're going to be talking about his new standalone novel, The Power Couple, which I read over the holidays, completely loved. It's a book reporter bets on selection. Welcome, Alex. Carol, thanks so much for having me. So let's start. Why a standalone novel now? Well, you know, 12, 12 novels, a lot of novels with the same, uh, you know, sort of characters and world. And, um, you know, first of all, John Wells, look, I love John Wells. He's been really actually an important part of my life for the last 15 years. Um, I've punished him a lot. He's, uh, he's, you know, he's been through more than any, any person should have to endure. But, but really, as you as you go further with a character, it's almost like the character is alive and the, the freedom of action you have with them uh, uh, sort of starts to, uh, starts to fall. Like it, the character gets older and has a real history. And unless you're gonna completely ignore that, um, you know, the character becomes somebody who has a groove in his life, just like, you know, it's just like real life. Um, so that was one reason. And then with, with big espionage novels, I think it's actually harder to do than with a crime. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're writing police thrillers, um, you know, a murder, look, murder is a murder is a murder in a way. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but the, but the police officer doesn't have to save the world every time. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can have a satisfying story that doesn't involve really high stakes that, you know, it doesn't have to be a serial killer every time. It can be a well-told story of a, you know, of a, of a, of a, of a single murder or a single, you know, it doesn't even have to be a murder with espionage, um, big, you know, big genre espionage, the stakes want to be high every time. And, mm -hmm. uh, and there's only so many times John Wells can save the world. And, mm -hmm. uh, if he's not doing that, uh, you know, I sometimes would hear from readers like, Oh, this mission sort of wasn't worthy of him, um, and so that was something that I I felt like after twelve of these, he needed a break. I needed a break, and uh, and so I wanted to do something else. And then specifically with this, I wanted to write, um, see if I could write a female protagonist. And uh, you know, there are really three main characters in the power couple. There's there's Rebecca, Brian, and then uh, and then their daughter Kira. And so two of those three characters obviously are female and um and so that's a different feel than the wells novels the wells novels are sort of very stereotypically he's the man alone he has to save him you know he's saving the world and yes there are women in the books but it's a very male dominated world and i really wanted to write a uh, a world that was you know that had a female character in it and also a character who was um you know she rebecca is she's trying to survive in the fbi which is a male dominated world so can she do that and what does she have to give up to do that and the fact is she's very good at it and um and 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 it works for her but in some ways she realizes towards the end of the book that she has given up some you know some some time with her family that that she has law you know it hasn't been cost free for her and i think that's a little bit of an undercurrent in the book. And honestly, the thing that I'm happiest about in the book is that, uh, you know, so, so far it's gotten a lot of reviews on Goodreads. And uh, most of those reviews are from women. You know, women, women tend to, you know, they read more fiction than men. They, they read more uh, domestic thrillers than men. And the women who reviewed the book, it, you know, they don't all love it. Some like it, some, you know, some like it a lot. Some don't like it as much. But almost nobody has said, hey, these women don't feel real. Mm -hmm. You know, this feels like a man wrote this and, you know, he just wrote a Barbie and, you know, and, and it's stupid and it didn't work at all that way. These women are real and they're complicated. And I mean, Brian's complicated too, obviously, but, but I, felt, I felt and I feel really good 
that, that that's been the response from female readers. Mm -hmm. I would completely agree. So when we open the book, the family's on this idyllic vacation, the vacation I would like to be on, <laughs> and it implodes as Kira, their college-age daughter, is abducted. And while it seems like it's random act, we start to learn it's not quite what it seems. And then our antennas start to go up as readers. It's like immediately, wait, wait, what's going on here? Your plotting here is completely propulsive. Did you do that in advance or did you wing it with the book? No, I did it in advance. Um, I, I always I always outline my books in advance. And I know there are some, there's a few people who don't. I know Lee Child, for example, doesn't. And sometimes uh, I think, you know, you can get to really, if you're really good and you do it that way and you can really walk the tightrope, you can, I think, write books that maybe are more surprising because mm -hmm. there's, you know, they, because you really didn't know what you were doing going in. And so it can be totally surprising. I think, unfortunately, for most people who, you know, who aren't Lee Child, um, and even sometimes with Lee, you can see sometimes he kind of writes himself into a corner and has to just kind of like pull something out of a hat to get out. But for me, I'm terrified that I would write half a book and not know where to go. Mm -hmm. So when people tell me, uh, you know, when people write me and ask me, oh, I'm a, you know, first time novelist and I don't know what to do, or, you know, I don't know if I should outline, I always say outline, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, so, so I do, I mean, I think again, you, you can lose a little bit of spontaneity but you gain assurance that you that you know where you're going. That's a good line. That's a really good line. By the way, Lee's brother is now taking over writing the books and he's outlining. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this wing in no, a prayer. Lee, I mean, it is, it is amazing that that, uh, that he is able to write those books with no outline. Yeah, it's like, well, they get stuck in the bathtub once in a while too, you know, can't figure out how to get out. So the storytelling is first told by Rebecca and then by their daughter and later by Brian. And I really thought I knew what was going on till I hit the Brian section about page 209. Yeah. The story completely flips. And was there always a plan? I guess there was a plan to always tell one story first and then the other, because really I only knew one point of view of a little bit from Kira at that point. Yes, so, uh, I mean, that was my plan there. You know, I don't wanna say I stole it from Gone Girl, but I kind of stole it from Gone Girl in that, I mean, the, you know, that book is extremely brilliantly plotted, obviously. I mean, uh, you know, with the, with the, that's wheels within wheels within wheels where you have the, um, you know, you have the game that, uh, that she's, that, you know, that Amy's playing um, and then, the, you know, the intentional birthday game she's playing. So, and all those things add up, but, but broadly you sort of hear from her and then you hear from him. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I thought that worked really well and I wanted to do something like that. The difference in this is it's intercut with the kidnapping, right? So, so you have Kira, who's sort of, you know, she's sort of in her own world, but she, you know, she knows her parents as well as as anybody. So you get you're getting a taste of what she thinks the marriage was like too. But mainly, you're seeing it from Rebecca's point of view, and then suddenly you see it from Brian's point of view. And and it's not that either of them is lying. I don't like. Uh, stories where the narrator is so unreliable. I mean, the narrator can be unreliable about his or her emotions, but I don't like stories where the narrator lies to the reader. Because um, I think I think in fiction, you're trying to craft a world that is consistent, that people can believe in. And when you have a narrator who just suddenly pulls the rug out and says, I told you something that's completely untrue, it's a reminder of the artificiality of the world that you're inhabiting. And so I don't like that. So, so these characters don't lie but they have their own view of the situation. And, you know, Rebecca doesn't know everything that Brian's doing and Brian doesn't know everything that Rebecca's doing. And so there are secrets, but there are not really lies. And so, so I, did want, I did want it to be, you know, I did want the Brian section to be a surprise without it being based on lies, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, Brian's section starts with this line, Brian was taking it easy this winter. <laughs> Okay. You play that back like later on. And I felt like that line is this perfect start for us to be introduced to him. And the scene um, is back before, even before they met. And from the very few paragraphs right there, we see Brian completely differently than what we had seen Rebecca presenting along the way. Yes. And so when I got there, was that the line like right from the beginning or did you go back and write that one? No, that was, that was his, you know, his, uh, it's interesting that you thought that was such a seminal uh, line. I mean, he, he is, you know, he, as he says at one point, his great sin is that he is, he's lazy, you know, he's a smart guy, but he's lazy and he's not, and he's not really sure what he wants to be. And so he comes upon this woman who's, 
you know, she's she's pretty and she's driven and she's smart and she's sort of a completely social, different social class. I mean, you know, it's not that she's a billionaire or anything, but as he says, she's from this sort of northeastern, you know, snobby intellectual uh, class, and and he's you know he's from the Midwest, and and so it's not exactly that he's intimidated by her, although secretly he is a little bit. But um, but he allows her to 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 draw him in. And in earlier drafts of the book, and actually, uh, you know, Simon Schuster, I think, correctly told me to sort of tone down the sex. There's still sex in the book, but it was more clear that you know the number one thing that he was offering is that he's a real player. Like he's very, you know, he's very self-assured sexually, and this is you know not exactly something that she's had before, and she really likes it. And and they kind of you know, they kind of have a very, very sexual relationship at the beginning. And for better or worse, that kind of relationship can hide deeper problems, especially if you wind up getting married quickly and having kids quickly. It's sort of like before that first real wave of sex has faded, you're together. Um, and so Brian, you know, Brian, the Brian's part of the bargain is, you know, I'm going to let this woman sort of take over and, 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 you know, I haven't been motivated. I'm smart, but I'm a little bit lazy and I'm okay with that. And then it turns out as time goes on that he's kind of less and less okay with that. And at the same time, you know, Rebecca, who should have had a better idea of who he was, <laughs> um, uh, you know, gets more and more aggravated over time that she, from her point of view, he's not pulling his weight. I mean, it's been funny to me to read some of the, you know, again, because I do like to read the Goodreads reviews because, you know, it's really, it's, it's, it's not critics, it's folks just reading and telling you what they think. Um, the Goodreads reviews have said, I don't like either of them, a fair number of people have said. And, I, I, and that's surprising to me because, you know, I, I certainly, you know, I don't think Rebecca is dislikable. And I think Brian, you know, to some extent, I, he has his own issues, obviously, but you see where he's come from and how things are not always easy for him. So, but especially with Rebecca, I'm surprised people say they don't like her because she's tough, but I don't think she's a bad person. Mm -mm. No, I don't either. You know, and then Brian creates this app and sells it for a lot of money. Yes. And that makes him worth more though, in Rebecca's eyes, because yes. all of a sudden he's pulling his weight. Like he's not just sitting around the house. So finances and who contributes to the marriage financially can be really tricky. Yes. And it's a lot bigger than socks on the floor. I mean, it's a bigger, yes, and than I, you know, and I think that's something you don't hear about that much in novels. You know, there's, especially in sort of, uh, you know, a lot of commercial fiction that's, you know, that's set in upper middle-class suburbia or, you know, it's, there's this, the bills just get paid. Every, everything is okay. And you never really have to worry about anything. Well, the, you know, these people make, they may, you know, Rebecca makes decent money. She's, you know, she's an FBI agent. She's not, they're not broke, but money is a constant problem for them. Mm -hmm. And actually that's probably the most transactional moment in the book for Rebecca is this idea that, you know, when he sells this thing and makes this money that she feels better about him. I mean, that is a little bit of an ugly side of her personality that she doesn't really want to admit, but you see very clearly that he sees it. Um, but yes, the, the money is an issue in the book. And, um, and I, you know, I wanted it to be, I didn't want this to be, uh, you know, easy. And I also, you know, but I didn't want it to be, oh, you know, we're so poor, we're living hand to mouth. No, it's decisions that they make, uh, or especially that Rebecca makes that make their lives more difficult financially. Mm -hmm. It's the car she buys. It's but then when they move from one location to the other, it's more expensive. We yep. can't buy a house. We had a great house and down here. We can't have it over here. And that's where it really starts to play. I mean, when she's yep. outside the the the, the belt line, and then yes. all of a sudden she's like, wait a second, what have we done with our lives? You know, yes. where are we going? So but we've got the marriage, we've got the espionage story, and I've just got to add the line. Was there always a plan to marry the two? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, there was. I mean, that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see if I could write a book that was part domestic thriller and part, uh, you know, sort of a more traditional uh, kidnapping slash espionage uh, book. And, um, you know, I think in the, in the cover letter that, I, that Simon Schuster sent out, I had this line that I thought was really, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it's a little, it's almost too clever for its own good, but I did think it was clever. It's this idea of, you know, a marriage is, it's, it's it's him it's her i mean this is every marriage it's him it's her and then the marriage is almost its own thing mm -hmm. right the, the the dynamic of a marriage so you know i'm not talking about a year but i'm talking about a marriage that's been 10 years or more and there's kids and there's a real relationship whether it's good or bad it's 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 almost a third party you know with the with the with the people and so that's kind of what the book is right there's the 
there's the there's the domestic thriller the story of the marriage there's the kidnapping the story of the um you know of kira and what's happened to her and then there's the interplay and how those two things come together and make a third story yeah you're married 10 years i'm married 35 and it's you're capturing what a marriage is like through the years too because what you're doing is you're charting this course of it whatever and their responsibilities are changing and we're seeing it from both of their points of view and that's what i really loved on the page they're spilling how they feel but i think there are a lot of harbored thoughts here like and you're going internal with them too so we can hear the harbored thoughts that aren't just coming through on the dialogue Yes. So, you know, I, the, the book breaks, you know, sort of the, 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 the great rule of commercial fiction is you don't go too bad, you know, you don't have too much backstory, you're always moving forward, you don't have too much internal, you know, monologue. I mean, look, I, I didn't want to write that book. I wanted to write a book that is more about these characters and that you do, you know, you do see them grow and change. I mean, it's funny, the book in some ways is is two days long right it's the story mm -hmm. of this kidnapping that literally unfolds over a 48 to 72 hour period but it's also a 20 year book and um and you know I, it's funny i had been reading uh so the, the the ken follett books uh you know the the cathedral books um and um and he's he's writing over the course of a century and you know and it's a great it's a great treat as an author to be able to write over a you know over a long period of time and imagine these characters changing and see them changing and and you know and because this is now you know sort of 1995 to 2019 essentially the book ends in 2019 there's some cultural stuff about the internet i mean these these two are both generation xers which i am and so um you know these these characters are my age and they, and i got to you know sort of relive some stuff uh, in the nineties and the, in the early aughts. And so that was fun too, but, but, but beyond the cultural stuff, the sort of the easy cultural references, the idea of what your life looks like when you're 20 or 23 or 25 versus what it looks like when you're 45 and you have kids, uh, you know, it, it's a, it, it's, it's something that fiction gets to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned that in a marriage, you marry the past, the person you met, the person you felt you fell for, but you live for the future of the family you've become. It's a really great line. And the questions that you pose from there are thought provoking. So it's really, you're looking at this marriage in all those different ways. It's who they think they're going to be, what's going to happen. And you also noted that marriage is a mirror. So Oops. let's talk a little bit about that. I like that. So, I mean, that, you know, that's the opening of the book and hopefully that will, will draw people in, but it's this idea that marriage, people say, oh, you marry your best friend, but in some ways you're marrying, you know, over time, you're marrying yourself. You're marrying this person who's always there with you and who knows you and you know, and who knows what's good about you and what's, and what's not. I mean, that's what a, you know, a real relationship. And that's why marriage, you know, when it goes bad, it can go so bad and be so scary is because you know, you have this person who knows every weakness as uh, your own weaknesses as well as you do, and you know her, you know, or his weaknesses as well as he does, and so you can really tear at the other person. I mean, that's when you know th there's not there's not a lot of secrets, uh, I think, in a marriage that goes on long enough. And if there are, when they come out, they're really devastating. So yes, this idea that it's a that it's a mirror. I mean, it's interesting to me because we've been doing nothing but talking about the marriage. If you, if you were going to describe the book in one line, you'd say mm -hmm. it's about the kidnapping, mm -hmm. but in reality, it's not about the kidnapping. It's actually about the marriage. Yeah, it is. But then it's also about these two people who are intelligence officers. Like they both are and different sides. He's with the NSA, she's with the FBI. So I just picture they both know how to lie. They both yes. know how to say everything, you know, go and back. I had a friend who was with the FBI and he was telling me these great stories about he'd get together for somebody, for the CIA, and they tried to say who has what kind of clearance? Like, what can I tell you? Right. Can I tell you? They know each, they wouldn't tell each other's names because you lie like all day long. And he says, you know, basically you go home and you start to have dinner and you're like, I can just have dinner. <laughs> I right. can't do this. But these two each know something back and forth. Forth. Have you seen this with characters? Like, what did you do? Did you study operatives? Did you talk to people? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of out of Wells. It's that world. I mean, it, you know, the FBI isn't quite as devious as the CIA, um, but they, you know, they'll still lie. Like, they'll still run undercover operations. And, you know, police officers and detectives and FBI uh, agents are allowed to lie to people. Uh, you know, they're allowed to lie to suspects. Um, you know, if you lie to them, you can get in trouble, but they can lie to you whenever they want. Um, and so, 
So, you know, Rebecca is, uh, you know, she's a bit of a secret keeper and, and so is Brian. And I think, I think you'd have to be a very strong person uh, to be able to leave that in the office entirely. And to, you know, to be somebody who's like completely on the straight and narrow at home, but then you go to the office and you behave completely differently. Um, and I think these jobs, you know, the, the rate of divorce among both, especially CIA agents is very high or CIA, uh, you know, operatives is high. Um, and, uh, and I think I, I, you know, you don't have to be, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg because the kind of person who's drawn to that world is going to be a secret keeper to begin with. But then on top of that, you have this professional ideology of keeping secrets. And I think, I think there's a lot of that. Yeah. It's like, you know, behind the scenes, what can I say? What can I say? And what did I really know that if I'd said we would have been in a different place? I mean, yes. think about that too. Responsibility. You know, Tony, the son doesn't have a lot of page time, but when he comes in, he lends a lot of story as a character. Was, was it always going to be two children? Um, Tony, to, to the extent there was an uh, additional, something that wasn't in the first outline, Tony was it not in the first outline. Um, and so uh, I realized um, you know, I thought it would be more, for, he's a little bit of comic relief, a little bit, um, you know, he's, he, and it just worked better to have, uh, to have him there because on some level, um, it raised the stakes even more because they don't know, you know, to the, when they, they don't know what's happened to Kira. So they don't know if Tony is also at risk. So that's a, that's an issue for them. Um, and, uh, you know, and Tony, I think he, you know, he humanizes uh, both uh, Rebecca and Brian a little bit. Um, uh, you know, it's funny with Kira. So Kira is, you know, Kira's older and Kira's, um, Kira really is in some ways like this perfect mix of the two of them where um, she's got this, she's got the hardness of Rebecca and, and in some ways she's got this sort of like, I don't want to say deceptiveness of, of, uh, of Brian, but to some extent, the deceptiveness of Brian. So she's she's much tougher than she appears to be, you know. And so, and so, when you see her, you see the parts of them that they hide. When we see Tony, Tony's more of the he's the other half of their personalities. You know, he's sort of he can be a little bit charming and goofy as Brian can be at times, and he can be, um, you know, he can be a, sort of a, a simple. Not simple is the wrong word, but uh, but sort of like a, a good, straightforward person as Rebecca can be sometimes. So it was nice to have somebody who you know who showed the better or the you know the other sides of their personality. Um, but yes, I did add him. It's interesting that you realized that. Yeah, it was, it, it's well, it, it just seemed like he was the perfect foil at some points. Like because yes. he'd sit there and say, "Wait a second, where is my sister? What's really?" And then he gets really worried. But he can have some of the worry that the parents aren't. Like he's articulating both of their minds and what they're trying not to say to each other, he gets to say. That's yes. what I saw. Yes. Yeah, he's allowed to. So at one point, Rebecca goes on a hunt for a clue that she needs about the abduction. It takes her down a really dark rabbit hole. And is she hardwired to like think of the facts objectively at that point? Or like, because of who she is at her work, does she just say, I'm going for it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're sort of talking about late in the story. Yeah. Um, uh, no, she's on, she's on a mission then. I mean, she is, she wants to know what's really been going on. And, uh, you know, she, she is, she wants answers and, uh, you know, and Brian actually wants answers at the end of the book too. He wants, to, you know, he wants some certainty that he doesn't have. And so the two of them are both looking for certainty in their own way. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and they both get it, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they both get it. Yeah, I'm not going to give away the ending at all, but it was pitch perfect. I mean, it was just like dead on what happens. Did you always know you're going to wrap like that? Even like, did you have that exactly scenario? We're not giving any that clues? scenario I did have. Um, that was something that uh, and it's interesting because oftentimes in the Wells novels, the books would change towards the end um, for one reason or another. Uh, and this time that did not happen. There were things that changed in the middle, but mm -hmm. the ending of uh, of you know them being down in the Caribbean months later, that was something I always visualized, and uh, and it worked. I think I hope. Yeah, no, it completely worked. It it's 
but here at, at one point during that scene, a character is ticking through four possible options objectively. She says uh, there's options on paper, but at the end there's one that's really just for the story's sake. You know, it's gonna it's gonna completely work. But seeing them play through in this character's head, we're not gonna say which one, was really fun to see. Is like I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, and in that scenario, was this one character easier to write? Like it, it was, who was easier to write? Was a man, the woman, Kira? Who I mean, I think, I think it's interesting. It's hard to talk about this without giving yeah. too much away, but, but, uh, you know, one of the things about Rebecca in general is that she's very, um, she tends to be pretty decisive mm -hmm. and uh, she knows what she wants and she knows what she's gonna do. And there's moments in the book, there's a few moments when that doesn't happen, you know, early on in the book when she, when, when Kira is sort of suffering from anorexia or getting close to suffering from anorexia, she doesn't exactly know how to handle that. And, uh, and so that's painful for her. It's painful for Rebecca when she doesn't know what to do. And with Brian, it's almost the opposite. Most of the time he doesn't really, he's okay. You know, he's not, he's happy go lucky. He's willing to sort of float but towards the end of the book, he decides what he wants to do and he's very decisive about it. And so, um, so it, it's a little bit of a role reversal where, where Brian knows what he wants more than Rebecca. And so, but the, and so the two of them have to figure that out together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you're also writing vividly about these scenes in Paris, Barcelona, St. Bart's at a time where we're not traveling anywhere, like, you know, going yes. to food stores and experience. Yes. Very voyeuristic um how much time do you spend in each city and uh, you know but, i mean it's funny with the wells novels i would they're they're set in places like pakistan and you know bahrain and saudi arabia so so i so i decided to be smart and be daniel silva and you know set this set this book in places that you'd want to really want to go like barcelona <laughs> so you know i was in barcelona i was in paris um i mean barcelona is a great city uh and it is it is funny um you know, because the book really does end in 2019. And, and, and I worked out the sort of the timing of it pretty carefully. So you can see, you know, they're, they're, it really is about 20, 23 years from the time they meet uh, until the, the end of the book. And you can go through year by year. But normally, the fact that it was published now, you wouldn't, you know, unless you're this kind of person who's really obsessive about the timeline, and I know some people are, but uh, you know, you wouldn't really notice that. You wouldn't notice that the book actually ends a little bit before present day. But because of COVID, you can tell, right? I mean, there's no, there's no, they are in a pre-COVID world. They are in a world where you can get on a plane and go to Barcelona and you can be in a bar and no masks, nothing to worry about. And um, I mean, in some ways, I, I, you know, I was rereading the book, getting ready for the interviews in Pub Day. And and I felt sad, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> we, we need to, we need, I hope we can get back to that pretty soon because, uh, uh, you know, that's a better world. I want to get down to St. Bart's. I mean, I'm yes. completely, I'm completely there. I'm ready to go. Yes. Um, I keep saying to my husband, the first thing we'll do is the Caribbean. I'm like, forget yes. anything else. I don't need to go hiking. I just work a nonstop. I want to go sit on a beach and do nothing. Yes. You know? I love the line that this is like the movies, Mr. and Mrs. Smith collide with Taken. And I have to say that every January, I feel like a Taken movie came out for a couple of years there. And I just want to say, just don't leave the house. Like, just don't go anywhere. Do you not know what's going to happen? Were you well, I mean, I'll say one thing, which is that, you know, Kira, I really didn't want Kira to be that character, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the younger, you know, the girl in Taken. I, she's, not, she's not sitting around screaming her head off. And then just like, oh, they're going to kill me. And, you know, daddy better save me. She wants out, you know, mm -hmm. almost from the minute that she's taken, she wants out. And, you know, and by the way, it's not just that she's snatched. Like she, and I think I can sort of give this part away because yeah. it's very early in the book. Yeah. She, she goes for, you know, she, she basically allows herself to be taken because she wants to get high, um, you know, mm -hmm. and. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, it's not a morality tale or anything. It's just how they managed to take advantage of her. Um, but so she, and she's aware of that, you know, she kind of got herself in trouble. Uh, I mean, not that anybody ever deserves to have anything like this happen to them, but, but you know, it happened be, in part because of decisions that she made and she wants out and she is willing to figure out exactly what to do to get herself out and, mm -hmm. uh, and to push you know, and to, and to take risks. And she knows that if she tries to get out and she fails, she might die. But she is, again, she is, she is Rebecca's daughter. She is mm -hmm. Brian's daughter. She is not going to sit around waiting 
for you know the helicopter to come save her and mm -hmm. so um you know that, i think i think look there are people who don't like brian there are people who don't like rebecca everybody who who's read the book thinks that kira you know is a is a very good strong character yeah yes and she definitely is was this always the title uh no initially the title was 21 uh and it's complicated as to why that was mm -hmm. but uh, it had to do with both the app and the fact that the marriage was sort of ending or you know the, the book was ending on their 21st anniversary mm -hmm. and people said well 21 is just it sounds like it's blackjack and it doesn't you know it doesn't make sense so then i thought well what about barcelona you know and they said well you know the book is it the book is not really it's set in barcelona it's not really about barcelona and what's the illustration going to be and um and so actually they came up with the power couple and as soon as they came up with it i was like that is the title that does that's a really good title i will say the cover yeah um, if you turn the book to this yeah i know exactly uh, yep so so that's very cool there now on the spine of the book you'll see those two rings so one <laughs> of the uh suggestions for si or that simon schuster came up with was two rings falling down vertically Oh, uh, wow. on the cover of the book uh, instead of the faces oh, okay. Okay. and i actually thought i thought that was really cool i thought that tells you it's a marriage and there's something in this marriage that you don't understand um but their argument was you know that that doesn't really tell you the faces are better basically and and they convinced me of that um mm -hmm. so uh but i thought that the i'm glad that they have the rings on there sort of as a reminder at least to me of what the cover, uh, you know, could have been. Could have been. You know, what's really funny is I've been looking at this cover for how long? Like, you know, months now. Months, okay. Yes. And then all of a sudden, the other day I went like this, and I was like, "Oh, I never really looked what was on the bottom. Like, I yeah. never made the play." So, readers, you can be smarter than I am. I'm yeah. teaching you now. You know, um, what are you working on now? Well, I, so I'm working on uh, mainly. I, you know, I've become this person about COVID, who's become, you know, I've got this uh you know i've spent a lot of time arguing about lockdowns and masks and all this stuff which we do not have to talk about um and i'm thinking whether i'm going to write a non-fiction book about covid after that i have to figure it out um you know i have a an idea for uh another non-fiction book that's totally I, it, I won't even go into what it is and then there's a possibility of a wells novel people really want the, and you know to some extent I feel like if I've written 12 of these books, I owe people some kind of ending, even if the 13th, you know, even if there's going to be no more books after the 13th, there should be some sort of resolution for Wells and Schaefer and Vinnie Dudo and the whole gang. And I have some idea of what that might be, but I'm not sure I want to do it. Um, uh, and then, and then I have one other idea, which actually comes out of, uh, 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 of something I wrote for the New York Times back in January of 2020, uh, before COVID again, which was all about masks, actually, and the surveillance state. And so it's this, it's this, uh, it would be a thriller sort of set in 2030 or 2040, where people are wearing masks to defeat surveillance. And there's this, and there are companies that are trying to fight uh, against the, you know, against the surveillance, and, or, or I'm sorry, they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, fight against the people wearing masks. And it's this, it would be a big dystopian thriller, basically. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is that's pre-COVID and now masks have a whole different feel to them. Yeah, and so yeah. I don't know what that book looks like uh, right now. So mm -hmm. I have a couple, you know, so I basically have, it's going to be, is it going to be a Wells novel? Is it going to be this big thriller? Um, you know, is there a possibility of a sequel to The Power Couple? There is, I'm not sure whether that makes sense. Um, you know, do I have another standalone in me? I, I have... I have choices. I have not started writing any of those. I probably shouldn't tell people that because people really want another Wells novel. <laughs> okay, guys, maybe. Like, maybe <laughs> you can just, you know, you can just share that. But no, I know. I think that sometimes authors are, they're being comfortable with a character and doing something different that makes you think, what do I want to do with that character next? Yes. You know? Have you listened to the audio? Um, I have, you know, I've never listened to the audio of any of my books and, and I should. Um, I've heard actually that that, uh, that the audio is excellent on this, mm -hmm. and I will say that you know the, the mainly it's voiced by Stephen Weber, but Marin Ireland, who's a who's a great actress um, who mm -hmm. I've seen on Broadway back when there was Broadway, um, and uh, you know she's she's great. She voices just a couple of small sections of it, and so I think that's really cool too. I've never had a book that uh, that two people have voiced. 
Yeah, I haven't listened to the whole thing. I just listened to a little clip at the beginning. But Marin, it's like she's somebody that we've um, we actually run an audio clip at the end of the podcast, and she's done a couple, and it's really a fabulous performance. It's always fabulous. So, well, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to see you after since two thousand six. You know, yeah, that's right. I mean, th you know, it's been a long time, and uh, well, thank you. And it's I, I, it's been interesting to me that the discussion really we've talked mainly about the marriage and not the kidnapping. And I do think that's what people will, most people will be, who read this book will be getting, um, you know, and what they'll be focused on. But it's, it's um, I hope that the kidnapping, uh, you know, I hope the kidnapping is interesting enough to people also. Oh, I guess that what's what's like, the kidnapping is completely interesting to me. And I could talk to you for hours about the kidnapping. <laughs> my problem is that then I'd be giving things away. Yes. And I, one of my big challenges when I do these interviews is to give nothing away, just get people excited about reading the book. Because we could talk about the kidnapping and we could talk about all the players involved and whatever. Yeah. I'm just trying not to, believe me, I'm trying not to spoil it and it's really hard to do. You know? Yes, I, I, I hear, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's interesting with the kidnapping in that the kidnappers have their own dynamics right and they're you know they're not they're not they're not married but there is there is some back and forth with them uh too and so um you know it, it sounds like a cliche but the book really is all about relationships it is and it's also who's the player who's the lead player in the kidnapping of the yes. kidnappers there's a hierarchy yes. and she's also kara is trying very quickly to figure out what that hierarchy is yes. like who's the one i've really got to play myself out of and who do i really need to she's totally trying to figure out the whole who are these people by just their feet because she's you know blindfolded at points yeah. and stuff it's like but there's one part where she calls herself targaryen and i thought that was pretty funny too yes. like, this is what i'm gonna do um well, Carol, it's been a it's been a pleasure. We'll have to do it again before 15 years go by. I promise. I promise. I promise. OK, All <laughs> thanks right. so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time.